welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Miata Lebele and I have been reviewing all things Bridgerton. We have now gone through episodes one through six and have made our way to seven. Y'all, we are in the home stretch. Before we even begin, please remember to thumbs up, subscribe, get in the comment section, and let's talk about all things Bridgerton. If you guys came back, thank you so much for coming back. I know I ranted and raved at y'all about episode six, but it was really important to me to really talk about the problems the episode had, particularly because I don't think I did a good job about talking about it in my overall Bridgerton review. So yeah, that was important to me. I wanted to really talk about how I didn't think that that was consensual. But anyways, we are now gonna start on episode seven. Okay, so we're starting off the episode with Daphne and Simon acting like absolute children. Okay, they are obviously pissed at each other. And she is like playing piano in a room that like backs up directly to where Simon is shooting with some men. Daphne starts playing the piano louder and louder and louder. And Simon, every time he shoots, it interrupts her playing piano and she throws open the door so he has to listen to her play piano. And it is obvious they cannot stand each other. At dinner that night, acting like complete children, they relay their messages to each other to their poor servants. Daphne tells Simon through a servant that she can't be expected to share his bed. The servant's like, yo, do I gotta say all this? Simon is like, no, you're my wife, you're sharing my bed. And she says something to the effect of, you cannot expect us to resume marital relations around these poor servants. I'm so sorry, y'all. I'm in the ghetto. And that she basically wants to go back to having separate bedrooms. As they continue to act like children, one of the servants delivers the latest Lady Whistledown, which actually has the news about the Colin Marina scandal. And of course, Daphne, she's been trying to get away from Simon. She's like, listen, I gotta go to my family. You can stay here. And Simon is like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Separate bedrooms is one thing, but us arriving separately and living at separate homes, that's not gonna work. And he also tells her that he is not letting her out of his sight until he knows that she's pregnant. Back in London, everyone is buzzing with news about the scandal. So Lady Featherington is outside of her home with her daughters and then Lady Violet and Eloise come out and Lady Violet looks at Lady Featherington and just completely is like, nah, 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 nah. I mean, she doesn't even wanna look at the woman. I am gonna talk over the course of this episode about how I think they got Lady Violet wrong. Um, the way she treats the Featheringtons in particular is the biggest thing this show got wrong about her. In the books, she would have figured out a way to help them. She would have figured out a way to make it less scandalous for both of the families. Watching her be so useless in this situation and just do nothing but snub the Featheringtons is just, it doesn't make any sense. This is not who the character is. And it frustrated me quite a bit. Eloise and her mama arrive at the Modiste where they're trying to get her hymns dropped and everyone there is staring at them because of the scandal. When Eloise comes up with an idea, she realizes that if she can get Lady Whistledown to retract what she said about the Featheringtons in the paper, maybe she can get the whole scandal to go away. Then cut to a scene where it's clear that Portia is trying to get Marina's baby maybe adopted somewhere when the baby is born, but the lady tells them that they need money to donate. And as we all know, the Featheringtons is broke broke. Hey, cuz. I heard you're having money problems. No, you didn't. Soon after, the Bassets arrive in London and they stop first at the Bridgerton house. Daphne gets out of the carriage and she's like, Simon, I don't need you for this. You can go head on. She arrives to find her family basically arguing with Colin. Colin really wants to see Marina. He thinks this is all a huge mistake and if he can just talk to her, they will be able to figure it all out. Now, Anthony brings up a really good point. He says, listen, at this point, everyone thinks that Marina has basically like gotten herself ruined before the season started. But if you go and see her, they're gonna think that you had something to do with her, that the child is actually yours. So, you know, Daphne comes in and her brothers are really surprised to see her. They're like, you're literally on your honeymoon. Shouldn't you be elsewhere? And she tries to shrug it off. Off. And Lady Violet says like, oh, well actually it's great to have the Duke and Duchess here because if everyone sees the Duke and Duchess acting like everything is normal, then this scandal is gonna go away quicker. But Daphne, she's mad at her mama because her mama didn't tell her the truth about what went on with the marital act. So she kind of makes a cutting remark to her mom right away. And you see Lady Violet kind of be taken aback. And both Benedict and Anthony give each other looks like, yo, this is not normal Daphne. So everyone knows something is going on. Anyways, Daphne tries to shrug that off as well. And it's like, okay, yeah, we can help fix things. The queen is having a luncheon, so they'll show up there to act like everything is normal. Colin, baby as always, basically gets pissed that they are settling things for him and just storms out of the room like, Way! I'm gonna stop being mean to Colin in season two. Um, I promise. So Daphne follows after Colin and she just tells him that they are so lucky to have learned about Marina's secret now instead of after the wedding. And Colin tells her like, no, I, I still love her. Daphne says something that is so bitter that Colin immediately is taken aback and is like, yo, is something 
wrong? Is everything okay with you back at Cliveden? He dodges the question by saying that if Colin really wants to see Marina, she'll figure out a way to chaperone a meeting between the two of them. Simon, you know what he does when he's pissed. He goes to Will's boxing ring and tries to like fight off some steam. And Will knows that something is going on with Simon and he knows that it has to do with his marriage and he basically tries to give him some advice. Simon gets home late that night, waking Daphne up and she gets up and sees him and is basically like, oh, so where you been all night? And he's like, I don't really owe you an explanation. And she's like, great, is this how our marriage is gonna be already? And he asks her, he's like, do you really think after three weeks of marriage, I'm already being disloyal to you? He says, um, why wouldn't you be? There's nothing left in our marriage. And now this is where things are kind of strange to me because I cannot figure out who Simon is supposed to be in this scene. He immediately looks at her and he's like, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that there's nothing left between us? And they get closer and closer and you can see that they miss each other and they lean in for this kiss and they're just starved for each other and they just start making out in the hallway at their London home. And he brings her over to the stairwell and he lifts up her skirts and he gets his face all up in her. And Daphne, she has a real good time. But then after she comes, she asks him if they should take it to the bedroom and he just kind of like stops, right? Right? And he's like, no. And it's like he kind of comes to himself and realizes what they just did. And Daphne asks him, what is to become of us? And Simon looks at her and he's just like, if you're with child, then I will stay with you and we will make what we can of this family. But if you're not pregnant, we're done with each other. We will live separate lives as Duke and Duchess. This scene felt super clunky to me. I don't know if anyone else felt that. It felt clunky to me on the first watch and it felt even clunkier to me on the second watch. It felt to me like what they wanted was for us to believe that Simon just lost himself to the lust, but doesn't it feel to you like Simon did this out of revenge? It almost felt like he knew exactly what he was doing because as soon as Daphne is like, let's go to the bedroom, he's like, like the way he says no felt like a cruel way of saying no. Nothing rang true for me in this scene. It felt like they wanted Simon to be so many different things. And it felt like this was the first time I ever thought like reggae seemed to be off in terms of what his motivations were for the scene. Normally he is so spot on. So for me, again, things just didn't ring true in the acting for me. Daphne sets up that rendezvous between Colin and Marina. And you can tell Marina is not super happy to be there when Daphne and Colin are like, thank you so much for coming. She's like, I wasn't aware I even had a choice. Colin asked her to tell him that what Lady Whistledown wrote was a lie. He's like, please just tell me that this isn't true. And Marina's like, I am so sorry, but yes, this is actually true. And Colin is broken. He is hurt. He's like, how could you do this to me? You know, we loved each other. And she tells him, not really. I hold you in the highest of esteem, but, and I mean, Colin is like, you hold me in high esteem and he starts to insult her a little bit and Marina stops him and is like no 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 I did not come here to be insulted by you that she didn't come here to be shamed by him or anyone that she did not know better that she did what she must and that no one helped her or guided her in her life about doing the right thing so yes she decided to look for the best father for her child he says that Colin is the only man that offered her even a glimpse of happiness and of course this upsets Colin again he feels like he was the only one gullible enough to fall for what she was putting out and as he takes his leave of her, he turns around and tells her the, the saddest, the saddest of words for Marina. He tells her that if Marina had just come to him and told him of her situation, he loved her so much he still would have married her. Just see Marina just like, yet another punch. You know what I mean? Like this girl doesn't need any more punches show. Leave Marina alone. Oh Lord, again, a fucking game. Nothing new, nothing changed, same old shit. Same old fucking shit. Of course, Colin leaves the room and Marina is like, I don't want any more scandal to happen for your family, Daphne. So she also leaves. Seeing everyone is at the Queen's luncheon. So the Bridgerton arrives and everyone in the town is so excited to talk to the new Duke and Duchess. You know, they're trying to curry their favor. The Queen walks up to them and tells them that she's wagered that there will be a child born by, you know, the next year. And Simon and Daphne are trying to pretend like really happy newlyweds, but something is so clearly off with them. Then Lord Granville kind of comes over and finds Benedict and he tells Benedict to hey, I miss you, you should come by the house for another drawing lesson. And Benedict's acting all awkward about it. And then Benedict sees Lord Weatherby over in the corner and Lord Granville's like, oh, would you like me to introduce you? Now, if you'll remember from a few episodes ago, Lord Weatherby is who Lord Granville was with when they were at that like orgy party, art party. Benedict feels all awkward about it and backs away. He's like, Mama, are you, are you calling me Mama? And then he just walks away from him. Eloise, poor girl, is summoned by the queen and the queen is like, who is Lady Whistledown? And Eloise is like, I think she's a tradeswoman. And the queen's like, that's all you got. 
na 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 girl. Okay, your queen demands you to get some more information. And you can tell Eloise is like, oh shit, I didn't mean to do all of this. Lady Danbury then walks up to Simon and Daphne and tells her that them coming into town is actually helping the scandal. Like fewer people are talking about it. And then she invites Daphne to this like married ladies party, which I love that party. I love that scene. More things like that. That was not in the books. I could have used a hundred more drunken women at a party, but I'll get to that soon. And whoo, Portia and the girls show up. And everyone in the tone is absolutely disgusted. You'd hear people saying things like the audacity of these people. I can't believe they would show their faces here. Eloise comes up and she rescues Pin and takes her off and asks how things are going. Penelope is like, oh, they're terrible, but how is Colin? And Eloise is literally like, he's fine. Your family is ruined. Are you guys gonna be okay? <laughs> And she tells her that basically her plan is to find Lady Whistledown and get her to retract all of the information she said about Penn's family in the Whistledown. Then the scene happens that would never happen in the books and it makes me so mad. Portia walks up to Lady Violet and is just like, oh my dear, like we were so tricked by Marina, that little hussy. And Lady Violet gives her the cut direct. The cut direct is when you just like don't even speak to a person, you just straight up look at them, look away, walk away. I don't know how to stop harping on this because this is not Lady Violet. I can forgive so many other show changes. Like Anthony, you ruined Anthony for me. That's okay. Penelope, you changed her. Colin, you changed him. But changing the basic decency of who Lady Violet is, to me, I'm just like, she never would have done this. What she would have done, like I've already said, she would have worked with Portia to figure out a way to save Marina's reputation and to save her own son's reputation. She would not have just given them the cut direct, especially not in public. Know how to stop being upset about this, so I'll move on. And after getting the cut direct from Lady Violet, uh, the queen's servant comes up to Portia and tells them that their invitation's been retracted and that they need to leave the party, which is just, oh, that is hard. And so, the Featheringtons leave and everyone is talking shit about them, except for Daphne, who's like, no, who do you guys think that you are? And then, you know, Daphne is already upset about what's going on with her and Simon, so she ends up finding a secluded area of the garden. Now what happens next is my absolute favorite scene in this entire episode. It is a scene that I wish had happened in the books. So Lady Violet follows Daphne. And she's like, baby, like, what's wrong? I can tell something's going on in your marriage. You can come to me for advice. That is when Daphne lets loose, thank you. He's like, oh yeah, you wanna give me some more advice, some more vague metaphors and trite remarks? Tells her mom that the advice her mom gave her didn't prepare her for marriage, didn't prepare her for the marital act, and that it didn't help her at all in what she needed to do next. She said that her mom sent her out into the world as a fool and nothing prepared her for her married life. As she's laying into her mom, Lady Danbury comes by and Daphne just cuts off the conversation and walks away. And Lady Violet tries to be like, oh, it was it was just the heat. She's overwrought from the heat. But you can tell Lady Danbury heard some of that stuff and knows that that is not the truth. So the next scene is actually back at the Featherington house. Portia has come home and is screaming at her husband, telling him that it is all his fault, that the entire family has fallen into ruin. And this man is so unconcerned. It is really weird to me how unconcerned Lord Featherington is with the ruin of his family. It doesn't just affect the women. If a family is ruined, it will also go to the men. He probably would have gone to his men's clubs and been equally embarrassed. So it is so strange that the show continues to just have him be like unaffected by anything Portia says. That does not ring true for me at all. But Daphne, who is changing a little bit from the person she used to be, stops by the Featherington house and she asks to speak to Marina. Marina starts to apologize for what she did to Colin, but Daphne stops her and says, no, you don't need to apologize. I understand what you did. Here's the thing. I think the show is trying to say that like now that Daphne Daphne has done what she has to do, rape Simon. She now understands why Marina did what she had to do. I don't like that they're showing this to be her whole motivation, but I do like that Daphne, out of everyone, at least is coming to the rescue of Marina. And this would have been something Lady Violet would have been a part of in the books. Marina then explains that when she first met George, she knew he was a soldier, but he was such a wonderful man and they fell in love. But now she looks at her life and she is completely alone. So Daphne tells her that she's gonna actually try to find information out for Marina about George, right? She says that General Langham is in town and surely he'll know where George is. Marina is like, I don't even see the point to this because George doesn't even want me. And Daphne's like, girl, 
this man needs to take responsibility for you, okay? So it's not about what he wants anymore. We're gonna find him and make him do the right thing. Lord Featherington then visits Will, and Will thinks that they're having a conversation about Lord Featherington possibly being a backer or an investor for one of his next fights. And Lord Featherington is like, actually, no. Will is favored to win in his next fight. So Lord Featherington comes up with a plan. What if you throw the fight and lose? And I will be one of the only people to basically put money down on the other man. Ooh. Lord Featherington is thinking like, if Will throws a fight, I will get so much money. And he tells Will that I'll give you some of the money as well and you will be set up for life. Will obviously gets upset and it's just like, I'm an honorable man, you need to leave. And Lord Featherington is just like, listen, Will, you can't do this for the rest of your life. You're gonna take care of your family after you stop being a boxer. And of course, Will is upset. How dare you talk about my family, get out of here. And Lord Featherington, right before he leaves, leaves his card on the table. Meanwhile, back at the bath at home, you know, Simon and Daphne are still barely talking to each other. And Daphne gets ready to go to the most amazing of parties at Lady Danbury's house. Again, y'all, we stand Lady Danbury in this house. We stand her so hard. She is a character that was very changed from the books. I love her character in the books, but I love her in the TV show too. I mean, I have no complaints about where they have taken this character. She arrives at the party and it is the best party in the season for me. I mean, the married women are all there. They are completely drunk. Everyone is gambling. They're all having a good time trashing their husbands. It is ladies night. Daphne is shown to a table where very coincidentally, Kitty Langham, who is the wife of the general, is sitting there. It's very obvious that Daphne's a little out of her depth. All the other women are much older, much more worldly at this point. They all place their bets, they start drinking, and then they start to play some games. Meanwhile, over at the men's club, Anthony runs into Simon and joins him for a drink. We cut back to the party and the ladies are having a good time. Daphne is killing it at this game and she starts talking to Kitty and she tells Kitty that she needs to find a certain soldier. Um, and Kitty's like, listen, I can't help you talk to my husband. We barely even talk, but I'll give you the address where you can write to him to find the soldier yourself. We go back to the club and Anthony is still rambling at Simon. You can tell he's been talking to Simon nonstop for like 20 minutes. And finally Simon is like, what do you want? And Anthony's like, why do you think I want something? And Simon's like, and Anthony's like, you right. Anthony's like, listen, whatever you did with my sister, I know it is completely your fault and you need to make amends. This kind of happens in the book too, but not in this way. Anthony and all of the brothers do think that Simon is the one at fault. Anyway, so Anthony and Simon are talking. Anthony is insulting Simon saying, I know you made this mistake. And Simon is like, Anthony, what would you know about this? You leave broken promises everywhere you go. I'm getting a little tired of your broken promises, promises. And Anthony is like, uh, listen, I have the responsibility of a whole family on my shoulders. You will never know what it's like to lead a family. And Simon is truly like, Anthony, who are you talking to? You are barely handling the little bit of managing your family that you're doing. Your father would be absolutely ashamed of you. And then Anthony gets slapped and they start fighting. I mean, breaking stuff all over the men's club. Daphne gets home from the party. Simon is already home and he's kind of like tending to the, the cuts on his face. And she comes in and is like, hey, I have four brothers. Like, let me help you out. She's tending to his wounds. They can't stop staring into each other's eyes. And she kind of sits on his lap and then they kind of start making out. And then she says, Simon, why won't you unfold yourself to me? And you know, like, why won't you tell me what's going on with you? And that's when he kind of gets up and pushes her off of his lap. She asks why he is so adamant about this vow to never have children. And that is when Simon explains that he made a vow to his dad dad and that it was on his dad's deathbed and Daphne gets upset. Now, I do believe that Daphne is fully in the right to be upset about something like this. Like Simon made a vow to his dead dad that Simon would never be happy. And she literally says something to that effect. She's like, so you're telling me you made a vow to your awful father that you would never, ever, ever have a happy life to screw over your father. That makes no sense. And Simon, you can see him. He's a little like, uh, oh, is that what that sounds like out loud? Uh, <laughs> But he's still like, no, I made a vow. And Daphne says like, but you also made a vow to me in marriage. So which one of the two vows are you gonna be breaking? So she ends up, you know, before she leaves the room, she's like, well, my period is due soon. So I guess we'll see how the rest of our lives are gonna go when that happens. Meanwhile, over at the queen's palace, the queen is reading Lady Whistledown, which doesn't mention anything about her luncheon. And she is so insulted about this. If anybody else in the show was smart, they would realize the only reason why it's not mentioned in the Whistledown is because the person who is Lady Whistledown wasn't able to really attend the party. Over at the Bridgerton house up in Eloise's bedroom, Eloise is talking to Penelope about who she thinks Lady Whistledown could be. Both know that it could only be someone that has been around the Featherington house, right? They know that it's probably not a servant. So Eloise is like, oh, it could be a tradesperson. You know, someone that comes into the house to do work for them. Eloise, super excited about this development, decides she's gonna tell the queen more about the news she has that night at a concert. Daphne, 
super proud of herself, goes to tell Marina that she's written a letter to the general. But um, Marina is really concerned because, you know, Daphne and Simon aren't talking, so Daphne didn't get the Duke to sign the letter. Only Daphne signed the letter. And Marina does not believe that the general will listen to a woman ask about one of the people in his regiment. Daphne's like, but I'm a duchess. And Marina's just like, girl, you do not know the way of the world, but good try though. Meanwhile, back at the Bridgerton house, you can tell that Anthony has really taken to heart what Simon said about him and his father being ashamed of him because he immediately goes and apologizes to Colin, telling Colin that he was a little harsh in the way that he treated him in regards to the Marina situation. It's actually a really nice scene to have between the two brothers. We don't have a lot of scenes just between the two brothers. We have a lot of scenes between Daphne and Eloise and they really establish the relationship that those two girls have, but we really don't get to see a whole lot of, uh, you know, Benedict and Anthony or Benedict and Colin or, or any of them. So it was really nice to have a scene like this. He reminds Colin that Colin will always have the love of his family and soon enough the love that Colin has for Marina will fade. And it's funny because he's clearly talking about his own situation with Sienna. Elsewhere in the Bridgerton house, Eloise is getting ready for really one of her first events where she's ever kind of come out. It's not her full come out yet, that'll happen next season, but but um, it's really nice to see her done up. She looks beautiful. Daphne's getting ready for the same concert and she's kind of looking at herself in the mirror, checking on her stomach to see if she's pregnant. And then Simon walks in and ruins the moment for her. And then they both go so sadly to the concert. Daphne and Simon walk in and Daphne sees her mother and she's still not talking to her. And then Benedict walks in and he looks over and he sees Lord Weatherby talking to Carissa. And this really bothers him because I think he's making the assumption that Lord Weatherby is making a pass for Carissa, right? And as we know, Lord Weatherby is Lord Granville's lover. He finds Lord Granville and pulls him to the side and is just like, please explain to me. I don't understand what is going on. And Granville explains that he is risking his life every single day for love because Benedict says something to the effect of, what about romance, you know? And Lord Granville's like, what do you know about romance? Every day I am risking my life for love. Benedict will never understand what it is like to sneak around to see the person that he loves and that it takes courage to live outside the traditional expectations of society. Okay, now I get it. So uh, like an episode ago, maybe two episodes ago, I was like, oh, I've seen a couple people throw around that maybe Benedict will be bi or Benedict will be gay. And that was kind of exciting. I no longer think that that is what the show is setting up. I would love to be wrong, but I don't think so. In Benedict's book, um, spoilers, I guess, but who cares? Benedict ends up marrying the illegitimate daughter of like of a member of high society before he even finds out that she is the daughter of like, I think an Earl or something like that. She is a maid. And so he falls in love with a maid. So I think what they're setting up here is Benedict being like, oh man, I'm a Mary for love one day and I don't care if she's a dirty little maid. <laughs> I've hung out with bohemian artists and gay people. I think that that's what they're setting up. So I would love to be wrong, but it kind of sucks that this whole like Benedict story is just so we can see Benedict like boringly fall in love with the maid in season three. Eloise is super excited and she finds the queen and she's like, yo, 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 yo. I think that Lady Whistledown is a tradesperson. The queen is just like, yeah, you're fired. <laughs> Basically, the queen has already hired the Bow Street runners to find who Lady Whistledown is, so she doesn't need Eloise's services any longer. For those of you that don't read a whole lot of romance or a whole lot of historicals, the Bow Street runners were considered London's first like professional police force. Eloise is then kind of crushed and finds Benedict and they leave the party together. Now the scene that follows is so outside of the realm of possibility in terms of what was considered proper. So Benedict gets Eloise and they go home in the carriage, but on the way home, Benedict stops to pick up his mistress and so they can go to like a party or fuck or something. This never would have happened in any reality, not just in a romance novel, it just never would have happened. Men never would have introduced their younger sisters. I don't care how close they are, they never would have introduced their younger sisters to their mistress. If for some reason the carriage had been stopped or something had happened and they had to get out and then people saw that Benedict was with his mistress with his sister, that would have messed up his own sister's reputation. I know they've tried to show Benedict and Eloise having this like, you know, really close brother sister relationship, but he still never, ever, 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 ever would have done this. Benedict picks up Madame Delacroix and she's really taken aback because she's like, why is your sister in this carriage? And Delacroix is trying to make, you know, some conversation and she mentions the Featheringtons. And that is when Eloise is like, oh my God, Madame Delacroix is Lady Whistledown. 
unbeknownst to her, who else would have access to everyone in the Tons' home and who else would hear all the gossip while she was fixing their dresses. Back at the concert, everyone is sitting in their respective boxes and Anthony is sitting with his mother and he looks into the crowd and he sees Sienna. And Sienna sees him and then Sienna reaches over and touches the hand of the new man that she is acting as mistress for. Violet, meanwhile, sees her daughter in the box across from them and her daughter's not making any eye contact and you can tell Violet is just yearning to fix the relationship between her and Daphne. We then cut to a very short scene where we see at the Featherington house, Marina is standing in the kitchen and she's looking at a whole wall of herbs. And I knew right then, I was like, oh my God, she's gonna try to put together some sort of concoction, either to drink and kill herself or try to drink and abort the baby. While Daphne and Simon are sitting in their box and he reaches for her hand and she takes his hand and there's this moment where you think they're gonna reconcile, but ooh, Daphne starts to feel something and she realizes that her period has come. She runs out of the room and starts trying to clean everything up and her mom walks in and Daphne just breaks down and starts sobbing. Simon can hear Daphne sobbing and you kind of see these tears well up in his eyes and then the episode ends. I wish I had more to say about this episode. Um, this also, this episode very clearly to me just felt like they were setting up all of the events that were gonna happen in the finale. And I'm not just saying that because there are like no sex scenes really, but it just felt more like it was setting things up for the final episode, which is fine. Many a penultimate episode do that. I think I was a little disappointed on my second watch through kind of being like, ah, that's where they're going with Benedict's character. I see. I think I was also disappointed, and I said this so many times with where they took Lady Violet's character. Um, Hopefully in season two, she's kind of a different woman, but I just don't know. I said this in another review that I know that they're just trying to humanize her and make her less like of a, a Mary Sue of a mother, like kind of a perfect Mother Teresa mother type. I miss her also being a woman who knew how to solve all the problems. And I miss her being the type of woman who didn't like to see the suffering of anyone, not just her own family. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost there. We have one episode left, okay? So get excited about it. Thank you guys so much for joining me so far. I have been so overwhelmed. I expected to have no more than like 15 views from my 15 initial followers. <laughs> maybe my mom and my brother, maybe our dog. So I am just so blown away. So thank you guys for being here and joining me. I've just been really happy to see this happen. It's been really nice. So I hope to see you on our final episode review. And uh, yeah, again, subscribe, thumbs up, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.